This series is about helping others achieve a higher level of success in the events that they plan. Because when they succeed, our industry only becomes better. At CLE, we strive every day to make memorable events with lasting impressions. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us a gentleman that has certainly created many memorable events and left many lasting impressions on those who've attended those events. And today, he continues to leave a lasting impression on our ever-changing industry. So without further ado, let me introduce our special guest. Our speaker, speaker is from Edinburgh, Scotland, and is the author, co-author, and editor of over 30 books in the field of live events, including the very first textbook on the subject. His textbook has been continuously published for over 30 years. He was a producer of live events for 20 years, and his clients include Oprah Winfrey, Donald Trump, Presidents Reagan and Bush, and many other luminaries. At the age of 40, he returned to university to earn his doctoral degree and then began a 27-year teaching career at four separate universities. He is now Professor Emeritus of Planned Events at Queen Margaret University. During his teaching and research career, he received many awards, including being the first educator to be introduced into the International Festivals and Events Association Hall of Fame, three Lifetime Achievement Awards, and the Professional Convention Management Association Educator of the Year Award. He also created the first professional certification program in the special events industry and was the founding president of the International Special Events Society that is also now known as the International Live Events Association. In 2019, his book of memoirs was published. The book is entitled The True Joy of Life, and it describes his 50-year career in live events, performance, production, and education. This positively reviewed book will be available to you following his talk, and he is happily, happy to inscribe the book for you. He and his wife, Nancy, have been married for 41 years in Edinburgh, Scotland. Edinburgh, if you didn't know, is regarded internationally as the festival capital of Europe. He and Nancy are also the proud grandparents of their first grandson, Hamish. Please join me in warmly welcoming guest speaker, Professor Joe Goldblatt. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Joe. you very much. Great yeah. job. Thank you. I wonder who's here today. If you're from the northern part of Des Moines or Iowa, could I hear you give a big whoopee? <laughs> if you're from the southern part, can I hear a big whoa? <laughs> if you're from the west, can I hear a big yo? If you're from the East, how did we do that, Matt? If you're from everywhere else, can I hear you? Now, I think you can do better than that. You know, in the events industry, oftentimes we come in 3, 4 o'clock in the morning after producing a lead event, as Nancy and I did for many years. And I'll never forget one time we came home, went to bed at 3 a.m., and at 4.30, there was a bouncing on my bed. It was our son, Sam, who is now 36. He was then three, and he was screaming, good morning, mama, good morning, papa. So we leaned and we said, good morning, son, go watch television. That wasn't enough for Sam, because he knows why you came here today to this production talk. When I said good morning, he said, it's not a good morning, mama, not a good morning, Papa. It's a great morning. By then, we were sitting halfway up, and we said, yes, son, great morning. Go watch cartoons. Wasn't enough for Sam. He climbs on the bed. He starts jumping from one parent to the next, and he says, it's not a great morning, Mama. Not a great morning, Papa. It's a grand morning. And indeed, that's what this day could become with your help, something memorable that you will use and remember all the days of your life. But you're my partner today. So I'm going to say to you, good morning. And I would like to hear from the timber of your voices how much new information, knowledge, and maybe inspiration you'd like to take away today. So I'm going to say good morning. You say great morning. And let me hear the volume. Good morning. Great well, that's pretty good. But I know you can do better. Would you scoot your chairs back just a minute? Scoot your chairs back. I don't want you to injure anybody. Scoot your chair back. This time, I'm going to say to you, as Sam did, great morning. And what I want you to do 
is leap out of your chairs. Creighton's going to lead you. And when you leap out of your chairs, I want you to put your hands in the air like this and really give me the most magnificent grand morning you've ever experienced in your life. So you ready, Creighton? You're going to lead them. I'm going to say great morning. You leap out of your chairs and say grand morning. You ready? Great morning, Des Moines. Grand morning. Well, indeed it will be. Give yourselves a big hand. Have a seat. So good morning. I want to reassure you that I have not come here this morning to announce my candidacy for President of the United States. <laughs> However, I do wish to thank Aaron Wetzel and the CLE Productions team, most especially Matt Kiernan, for kindly sponsoring this talk. Now please join me in thanking them together, won't you? I have been visiting beautiful Des Moines for over 42 years. You see, 41 years ago, I married a beautiful woman from Des Moines, which is why I have repeatedly told other men all over the world, if you want a happy life, go to Des Moines to find your wife. <laughs> My wife and some of our family are joining us here today. Give them a big hand, won't you please? Of course, having my family here increases my nervousness. You see, CLE's kind invitation to speak reminded me of when I was struck literally with the fear of God. I was invited to deliver the sermon in our 1,000-year-old St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. I asked the minister what he would like me to speak about, and he said, I'd like you to speak about 10 minutes and not much longer. Well, my friend Matt has given me considerably longer to share with you my thoughts, and he actually suggested the title for my address, and therefore my topic of never-ending story, the continuing power and evolution of events, is one that I'm pleased to share with you today. I suppose Matt inserted the word history in my talk because he believes that I am one of the oldest living members of our tribe of early event leaders. Speaking of uh, aging, a few years ago, we redid our wills as we became dual citizens of both Scotland and the United States, two different legal systems. And after we met with the attorney, I said to my wife, Nancy, I guess we need to think about perpetuity, where we might want to end up. My mother has a beautiful tomb in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I'd very much like to go there and be with her in the tomb. And Nancy said, Joe, do you know how hot and humid it is in August? <laughs> and I said, every August I'll bring you back to Scotland for the festival. So a few years later, we were in Italy visiting our beloved Aunt Nina, and she rests in peace in a gorgeous cemetery with sculpture and so on. And once again, I said, Nancy, why don't we join Aunt Nina in Italy? And Nancy said, you know I don't speak Italian. So that still is up in the air. However, one thing I have learned over the years of working with students is that concentration leads to greater learning outcomes. About four years ago, as an aging professor, the head of my university came to me and said, we've received a grant to teach all of the faculty mindfulness. And no one has taken up our invitation and I was wondering if you might be the first one to demonstrate to the others that someone at your advanced age can learn this new skill. Well, I guess he was saying that I was losing it, and he was really trying to help me become more mindful. Not only did I embrace this, because every Wednesday afternoon, they allowed me to practice mindfulness for four hours, and they paid me for meditating in a room. It was really tremendous. But I then introduced it to my students. And at first they were resistant, and then to my surprise, their concentration improved, the quality of their questions improved, and more importantly, their marks rose as a result of practicing mindfulness. So to help you get the most out of today's session, I'd like to invite you to just take two minutes with me 
and let's tune our brains. Would you place your feet flat on the ground, please? Place your back flat against the chair so that you feel the chair supporting your back. Let your shoulders relax. And just concentrate with me for a moment upon nothing more than your breathing. If you're comfortable, let your eyes get fuzzy or even close your eyes so that they're relaxed as well. Concentrate on breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. And now as you breathe out each time, follow my direction and feel just your feet for a minute, planted on the ground and the energy from the earth, the gravity pulling them towards the earth's surface. And now feel that energy move into the ankle, both ankles, the calf, both knees, the thighs, the pelvis, the lower back. Feel the energy start to gently move up the spine. Till finally, as you inhale and exhale, the energy is now between your shoulder blades. And as you exhale, feel the shoulder blades open widely like butterflies' wings. Now imagine your shoulders are starting to slope and you are actually a mountain. And your head is the peak of the mountain and your shoulders, once covered with snow, are now melting in the heat of the sun, almost like Crayola, dripping down, melting. Let the neck lengthen, the head rise, and when you're ready, gently open your eyes. Now, as I am mindful of our time together today, let's get down to business. This morning, I propose to examine with you the history of the events industry and the most important factors in creating live events. And then I'll turn to my career in live events, including my work with the people that Matt mentioned earlier. And then we'll look at the future of live events, the 22nd century forecast for the growth and development of live events. However, this all begins, this never-ending story, 70,000 years ago in the cradle of civilization, the great continent of Africa. Some scholars believe that the first rituals and ceremonies that would later form modern events were conducted here. Well, I wanted to find out. And so, about 10 years ago, I received a grant to visit both Australia and Uganda in Northern Africa. And in Australia, I worked for several weeks with the Aboriginal people to find out why they celebrated, how they celebrated, and what this did to influence their civilization. I then went to Uganda, and it took three days to get to an area way at the top called the Mountains of the Moon. I was there with government officials, and our job was to meet with the king of the Batwa Pygmy tribe, one of the last surviving Pygmy tribes. Well, their huts were so small and covered by overgrowth that we missed them three times. We drove back and forth. But finally, we saw them, and we got out, and upon meeting his majesty, the king, he said, Professor, I'd like to invite you into the forest to experience some of our rituals. Now, I don't know about you, but when a pygmy invites you into the forest and it's your first meeting, you might just hesitate, you know? Think about it for a moment. But I turned to the government official and he nodded to confirm that this was fine. And off I went and I found about 100 pygmies sitting in a circle 
passing around a pipe, and they were each smoking the pipe. They invited me to sit among them and be part of their tribe. I inhaled, and that's the last thing I remember about that research project. <laughs> However, from this research with both pygmies and aboriginal people of Australia, I learned that every human society celebrates their joys, their sadness, and their eternal hopes for the future. I further learned that we participate in these celebrations for purposes of kinship and the magical and mysterious outcomes that may occur. You see, when I walked back from the forest with the king, I said to him, tell me, as a result of these rituals and ceremonies, what is the outcome with your own members of your tribe? And the king said, I could explain it to you, but you would never really understand because you're not part of our tribe. It will be quite foreign to you. And when I said, please, at least give me an indication of why you do this, he said, stopping in his footsteps, we do this for the magic and the mystery that might evolve. Well, how many times have you organized a corporate meeting, an association meeting, a social event, a sport event, and what you planned did not necessarily occur in the same way you had written this down in terms of a plan? In fact, someone might have met there and fallen in love. Someone might have met there and proposed to their husband or wife. Someone might have met there and joined your association or been disposed to move their corporate business to Des Moines. So there is a lot of magic and mystery. So in addition to these indigenous tribes and other tribal groups, they also understand and embrace the magical power of events. Perhaps the best example of this is many years ago in Washington, D.C., when my wife and I started our event management company, we were invited by shopping centers to produce events for them. And one day in November, a woman called who was the marketing director of the shopping center, and she said, Joe, I have a big problem. What is it, I said? She said, I've hired a man to play Santa Claus, and he's horrible. So over to the shopping center I went, I saw a man sitting in the throne with cigarette burns in his trousers, yellowed beard, hacking cough, and I realized, Houston, we have a problem. I asked the director of marketing, would it be all right with you if instead of just replacing this one man, if we created a program called the University of the North Pole, where we trained men and women and everyone else to portray this wonderful character? She agreed. So year after year, we trained dozens of people to play Santa Claus, as a result of this, there was a lot of publicity. In fact, I was asked every Christmas to go on the radio and speak to the children of Washington to tell them what they would like to have for Christmas. So one year, when I was getting ready to go to the radio station, I told my son Max, go into your bedroom, close the door, turn on the radio, listen carefully, because you're going to hear the voice of Santa Claus tonight. He might even call you by name, and he's going to tell you what you're going to get for Hanukkah. See, our family is Jewish, but we celebrate everything because we're in your business, right? Max closed the door. Into my bedroom I went. I pulled on the red trousers, the red coat, the white beard, tiptoed past his door so he wouldn't hear me, stood on the front porch, and I looked at my watch and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm actually an hour early. I've misjudged the time. The radio station is just around the corner. And then I remembered there was a little boy up the street named Matthew who didn't have the good fortune that Max did that Christmas. You see, in October, his father had suddenly left his mother. And so this is going to be a Christmas without dad. So I decided to pay a surprise visit to Matt's home. I knocked on the door, and this little five-year-old, the same age as my son, peeked out through the door, and you can imagine how surprised he was a week before Christmas seeing Santa on his doorstep. I didn't wait for an invitation. I pushed the door open, walked in, sat down, pulled the little squirming tyke onto my knee, and I said, ho, 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 Matthew. 
Every year I travel all over the world and see millions of children. And last year when I poked my head down your chimney, ho, ho, I realized, Matthew, you're the luckiest little boy in all the world. Did you know that? He said. I said, oh, yes, Matt. Far greater than the toys I might place under your tree ho, ho, is the love your parents have for you. Did you know, Matthew, they love you more than any other little boy in all the world? Well, with that, his mother, Jill, came out of the kitchen, tears streaming down her cheeks. And I was starting to get emotional, so I said, Matthew, I must leave now. I have much work to do before I return on Christmas Eve. But I have decided, because you are the luckiest little boy in all the world, Matthew, I'm going to visit your home first this Christmas Eve. Therefore, I want you to be in bed by 5 p.m. He was in bed by 3.30. Now, if any of you have children, grandchildren, nieces, and nephews, and you'd like me to make that call from Scotland, just give me your email, and I'll be happy to call them for you. They'll go to bed early. Off to the radio station. Do you know Max even called in? He called in, talked to Santa Claus. I got home, and I tiptoed past his door, hoping he wouldn't hear me. The door opened. Little footsteps behind me. I turned around. And there was my son, awestruck. I realized I had disappointed him. But I pulled him onto my knee, just as I had done with Matt. And I said, Max, this red suit and white beard has nothing at all to do with being Santa Claus. Santa Claus is a feeling you have deep in your heart, not just one night a year, but all year long. It's an opportunity to bring love, happiness, kindness, and peace to the whole world. And I said, Max, the people who do this we call event managers. <laughs> he didn't buy a word of it. But now fast forward. It's the middle of January. I'm fixing a light bulb Saturday morning on my front porch. Matthew comes running down the street. Dr. Goldblatt, Dr. Goldblatt, is Max home? Max, Matt wants to see you. Then I decided to have some fun. Matt, did you have a nice Christmas? Oh, yeah. Anything special happened this Christmas? Oh, yeah, you didn't know? Santa Claus came to my house a whole week early. Matthew, I said, that's impossible. You have to visit Santa in the shopping center. He doesn't make a house call a week early. He said, he came to my house. Dr. Goldblatt, I'm the luckiest little boy in all the world. And you wonder if that corporate event, that association meeting, that sport event, that social event that you plan so expertly and deliver changes lives. Of course it does. Every life is changed by the events that you plan and produce. So Max now runs out on the front porch, takes a spot behind Matthew where Matthew can't see him. And as Matthew continues to babble about Santa Claus, in one little gesture, Max let me know why you came here this morning and why you're in this industry. Because as Matt babbled on about Santa, Maxie lifted his chin. Matt couldn't see him, but he looked me right in the eye and he went. <laughs> well, I ran in the kitchen, picked his mother up in my arms and said, he's one of us, <laughs> as are all of you, I might add, all of you. Following our move to Scotland, I invited the head of Microsoft's global marketing team to deliver a talk at my Scottish university. He began the talk by announcing to the students that he would not be using PowerPoint slides, just as I'm not using them today, although it was his job to continually promote this software. Rather, he said, he would rather have a conversation with these students, and his slides would be available online as an aide de memoir after his talk. He then explained that speakers of old would use overhead transparencies or even a blackboard to support their ideas. However, and this is important, the head of sales for Microsoft said, in the bold new world of experiential education, events now occur without end. By that he meant, as Dr. Donald Goetz at the University of Calgary suggests in his theory of planned events, the event experience begins prior to the event occurring through anticipation generated by advertising, 
public relations, or marketing messages, now generally online. The event experience then culminates during the event itself, which is often short in duration, but intense in terms of feelings and emotions. Following the event, the experience continues through post-event networking and sometimes lifelong friendships. Therefore, according to one of the leaders of a firm that revolutionized communications today and in the future, events that you produce shall indeed for the first time in human history be without end. And I believe that you and your colleagues are the catalyst for this new revolution of achieving greater experiences and profound transformations through live events, one guest at a time. The Harvard University economists, Pine and Gilmore, knew this. And in 2000, they based upon their research, based upon their research with hundreds of corporations and organizations, they coined the term the experience economy. According to Pine and Gilmore, in the past 100 years of our economic system, our system has evolved from the agrarian to the industrial means of production. They suggested that leaders such as yourselves could now layer a commodity with an experience and charge slightly more without any additional expense and therefore generate a significantly greater surplus. They suggested, they further suggested that the most powerful and bold economic period will be one where event leaders such as yourselves create an environment for your guests where they are literally transformed in some measurable way. I believe, with all due respect to my colleagues at Harvard University, this is actually old wine in new bottles. For you see, a few blocks from our home in Edinburgh is the tomb of the author of The Wealth of Nations, the famed economist Adam Smith. Smith was much more than an economist. In the 1700s, during the great Scottish Enlightenment period, he firmly believed that no enterprise could do well, no enterprise could do well without first doing good. In other words, events that seek to move from the old to the bold way of thinking must find ways to transform their guests and measure this transformation and then communicate these profound challenges to their stakeholders to let them know the positive impacts of their event experience. One example of this actually took place in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. My family had a wonderful Aunt Dot who we adored. She was quite religious and we were there for a family reunion. And I said, having read the book, The Experience Economy, Aunt Dot, Nancy and I would love to host you for an experience you'll remember all the days of your life. She said, that's fine. And off we went to one of the businesses profiled in the book, Planet Hollywood. In we walked, loud music, moving lights, loud voices. And Aunt Dot actually turned to me and said, this is what hell must be like. I quickly escorted her out in the parking lot and I said, what's wrong? She said, I can't dine here. And so we found a very quiet Italian restaurant for a lovely evening that was appropriate for her. But the good example that Pine and Gilmore use is actually the Rainforest Cafe. Because unlike Planet Hollywood, which is static, nothing changes, in the Rainforest Cafe, as you know, every 15 minutes the mist comes down, the animals roar. When you arrive, they invite you to explore the gift gallery. So they create not a static, but a dynamic experience. And I recommend that you consider this as you're designing your events, add as much dynamism, change as possible. So whether you are organizing and evaluating a small local event or a mega spectacle, according to the legendary producer of Disney's Main Street Parade, who is also the creator of the Radio City Music Hall Spectacular, Bob Yanni told me when I wrote my first book in 1989, this is a man who had produced major spectacles, he said, the integrity of the event does not change based upon its size. So if you are holding a small cultivation event, 
for philanthropic purposes for 10 people, the amount of planning, the amount of sensitivity, the amount of care that goes into that event is the same, according to Bob, as producing a Super Bowl halftime spectacular. Therefore, I believe, and some research points to this phenomenon, that the future of live events will be harnessed by professionals who carefully align the needs, wants, and desires of the audience with the outcome of the event. They align the needs, wants, and desires of the audience with the outcomes of the events. You see, Yanni, Bob Yanni, was one of the first producers to utilize flip cards in large stadiums to create images in the seats through engaging the audience as members of the cast. And now, 50 years later, we see stadiums equipped with LED lighting effects embedded directly into the seat itself. And we also see rock concerts with wireless electronic devices that enable the audience to be programmed, to create images and messaging that is then projected upon giant LED screens. And wireless systems have now further enhanced this idea. It is literally all about producing, as the Greek philosopher Socrates said many years ago in ancient Greece, the human outcome. You see, the term event is literally one that, that has origins in the Latin word a venire. A means out, venire means come. Therefore, all events are first and foremost, indeed, human outcomes. Perhaps that is why in 1989, after interviewing over 100 event professionals throughout the world, and this was done, by the way, before the internet <coughs> made it easier, or email made it easier, when I wrote my first book, I came to the conclusion that special events are a unique moment in time, celebrated with ritual and ceremony to produce specific outcomes. And I believe this definition has stood the test of time. With this we caveat, the 21st century event, as Adam Smith suggested with his theory of the invisible hand of supply and demand influencing the economic system, is largely dependent on many other variables as well. One of these variables is what the Wall Street trader Nassim Tlaib described as black swan theory. According to Tlaib, who was one of the few Wall Street traders to avoid the economic crisis of 2007 because he anticipated that the economic performance within the markets was too good to continue, he removed his funds because he believed that an external event that comes as a surprise has a major impact and is often inappropriately rationalized after the fact with the benefit of hindsight. And he called this major event a black swan. Black swans may be the harbingers of pain or power, depending upon how you, as 21st century event leaders, plan for these future occurrences. In the 20th and 21st century, we have many examples of how this type of event from the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor to the invention of the internet to the financial crash of 2008 and of course the surprise presidential election outcome of 2016. As events evolve from the analog to the digital world, we must simultaneously be cognizant of the fact that more and more often black swans will appear on the horizon. For example, in the case of World War II, the war led to the invention of the jet airplane, and this led to greater opportunities for international travel and global trade. And we know that the internet brought unparalleled opportunities, but also worrisome challenges through limitless communications. With every potential black swan in our path, there is the opportunity for greater good or immediate failure. I believe, and again, research has proven, that the research and planning process for event managers directly correlates with the optimum financial su success factor of all of the outcomes that you wish to achieve. Therefore, the more time invested in research prior to the event, 
And the more time invested in evaluation following the event helps ensure the rest of the phases to operate more so smoothly and produce a better outcome. Now, one example of this could be seen in the opening ceremonies of the Sochi Winter Games, Olympic Games in Russia. You may recall, if you watch that on the television, that the lighting effect at the opening ceremonies actually failed when it attempted to project the iconic five Olympic rings as a hologram. Well, worldwide negative publicity resulted. The Russians somewhat overcame this by making fun of their mistake and fixing it in the closing ceremonies. However, the clear message here is that technology, with technology, rehearsal and redundant systems, backup systems, are essential when preparing a hopefully flawless outcome. And that's another reason that I admire firms such as CLE for hosting eight talks annually to help raise the bar of professionalism in this industry. During my half century of producing events, perhaps the greatest transformation and evolution I've seen is the rapid development and improvement and expansion of technology in live events. One of my latter books was entitled 21st Century Meeting and Event Technology, and it was written by two of my PhD students, half my age. I gave them the privilege of writing the introduction to the book, and they wrote in the first lines, we've written this book with a much older professor. <laughs> he happens to be a digital immigrant. We are digital natives. So whether you are a digital native, part of generation X or Y, or millennial, or you are a baby boomer who's a digital immigrant, having this sense of infinite curiosity about technology can only help you. So some of these examples include wireless systems for audience interaction, including surveying, polling, and voting, the transition to LED lighting and video systems to reduce power usage <coughs> and improve the overall presentation quality, the incorporation of social media before, during, and following the event to produce events without end, and the transfer from manual to automated registration and now online systems, as well as the use of moving lights and lasers to excite and create focus upon the stage, as well as generate versatility and send key messages, and perhaps most of all, the incorporation of technology, most of all, the incorporation of technology to reach audiences with disabilities, such as providing audio description for individuals with visual challenges and looped systems for those individuals with hearing challenges. Firms such as CLE Productions, I believe, from what I have studied, are on the cutting edge of revolutionizing these transformations. And in so doing, in fact, are transforming the respect and admiration that live events as an industry so richly deserves. However, all of the machines we may invent shall never trump the need for well-trained and highly experienced technical providers. <clears throat> One example of this was when I produced for a certain businessman in Atlantic City, New Jersey, the opening of his first casino, the Trump Taj Mahal. The day before, we had winds of 50 to 60 knots. We weren't sure we could continue to produce the event outdoors. However, I gathered together all of the technical leads, lighting, sound, video, laser, brought them into my suite, sat them around the table. Thank you. And one after another, thank you. I said to them, you realize we will not have a rehearsal. You realize we have inclement weather. And according to the Weather Bureau, it may indeed worsen. How do you feel about producing this event live on national television tomorrow night without a final technical rehearsal? And the first man said, lighting, ready to go. Next man said, lasers, ready to go. The woman in charge of sound said, ready to go. And the last person turned to me and said, 
didn't you actually hire all of us because we had experience with the Super Bowl, Olympic Games, the Goodwill Games, and so much more? We're ready to go. And indeed, based upon their confirmation and help from the weather, we produced that event without any final technical rehearsal, and it was seamless, flawless, successful. So that's why it is so very important that you appoint the best technical support for your event. However, despite our best inventions, training, and efforts, as you can see from that story, we simply cannot control the universe. I've often believed that one of the reasons event management became such a popular major at universities and colleges is because students, somehow or other, truly believed that after a few lessons and with a little networking, they would soon be producing the Macy's or Tournament of Roses Day Parade, the Super Bowl halftime show, the Olympic Games opening ceremonies, and even Iowa's iconic rag bri. They imagined themselves as great puppeteers from above, controlling thousands of tiny movements on a grand scale. They almost see themselves as event managers who are somewhat godlike, and those who support them as their better archangels. Well, we all know that this is indeed, to use the popular word today, fake news. Successful professional event management careers are the result of years and years of extensive progressive experience in a wide range of event settings. Interestingly, it is also helpful in some cases, and in some cases essential, to have professional qualifications, such as the internationally well-respected Certified Meeting Professional, CMP, Certified Special Events Professional, CSEP, Certified Festival and Event Executive Certification Programs. Regardless of education and qualification, nothing shall ever transcend the requirement of experience and hard work. After all, these puppeteers pulling all the strings often have to make very difficult decisions with a moment's notice. One example of this is my friend Jean McFadden, may she rest in peace, who produced for over 25 years the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Jean told me that for the first 15 years, as would happen, the police, because they were so integral to the parade, were given the honor of leading the entire parade, and they led the parade on horseback with about 20 horses. And of course, you know what horses do. And so the rest of the parade had to walk through all of the gifts that the horses left behind. So finally, Jean said, enough of this. I'm going to use my southern charm to talk the police department into moving to the rear of the parade. I'm going to tell them that they've been selected to have the honor to escort Santa Claus, who's the big star of the parade. Well, the police listened, but they were having nothing of it. They didn't believe it. And the day of the parade, she called on the radio to ask one of her marshals, where are the police? They're supposed to be at the rear in front of Santa Claus. And the marshal said, Jean, look up front and to the left. And there, at the beginning of the parade, just as she was ready to step off, were 20 police horses, all turned with their bum facing her, and upon a cue, well, you don't want to know the rest of the story. In many ways, event leaders such as yourselves who wish to transition from the old to the bold new world of modern celebration must remember that at the root of our efforts is the opportunity to change lives for the better. In this regard, there is a need for a revolutionary approach to how we envisage modern events. Events are not only placemakers, as some city officials prefer to describe them, they are fundamentally change makers. Yes, as Pine and Gilmore concluded, events have the ability to transform people, organizations, communities, cultures, and cities. Now you may ask, well, how do you measure this change? I was asked in my research institute in Scotland to study an event entitled Celebrating Fife. Fife is a kingdom near Edinburgh where most of the Scottish kings were first crowned, such as Macbeth and Malcolm and so on. 
And one year, they decided to orchestrate 400 events, and they appointed me to measure and evaluate them. So we selected two tools for doing this. We, of course, had the basic economic evaluation, but then we wanted to measure what we call the happiness factor, or well-being. And we used a scale called the Warwick-Edinburgh Mental Health Well-Being Scale, and one that measures communities called the Social Impact Progress Scale, SIPS. So these two scales were used to ask citizens before the event, what are you feeling today? Happiness, sadness, anxiety, etc. And then after the intervention of the event, we would ask the same battery of questions and we would be able to measure numerically whether the scale rose or fell. And in every single aspect of the event that we measured, from food and beverage to transport to parking to programming, et cetera, the scale rose significantly. The council has now adopted that as their official measurement tool to comprehensively measure how events deliver outcomes for communities. But despite our best efforts to measure and evaluate every aspect of any event to continually prove the worth, such as through economic impact, has increased or remained static for investment, I really believe that all of you know in our hearts how important it is, how important our work is to those we serve. When I was studying for my doctorate at the George Washington University, my dissertation director said, you've done all of these quantitative studies. Now it's time to do something that deals with how human beings feel, a qualitative study. And he sent me to a nursing home, a care home, on the outskirts of Washington, D.C., in Bethesda. And I remember walking into the room, and there were about 10 people seated around a table in wheelchairs, and they were all quite old, and some of them quite unwell. And there was one woman, however, seated about right where you are. And as I asked questions about, tell me about the events of your life and what they mean to you, what types of events did you experience, why did you attend, what did it mean, she sat there the whole time just shaking her head like this. Well, I thought it would be best if I quit a little early, and I excused myself. Thank you very much. And at that point, this woman raised her hand, slammed it on the tray in front of her wheelchair, and said, young man, well, she got my attention. I was 43 years old. I like being called young man. I said, yes, ma'am. Then with her eyes piercing into my soul, she said, these events that you describe are not merely festivals, corporate meetings, association conferences. Really, I said, Madam, what are they? She said something I'll never forget. She said, these are the milestones of our lives. So of course, I asked, to give them, asked her to give me an example. She said, my husband had been diagnosed with cancer several years ago. He didn't have long to live. But my daughter was planning a big wedding. He wouldn't miss that wedding for anything in the world. And so he rolled down the aisle in his wheelchair, holding our daughter's hand to take his daughter to the altar. A few years later, after he died, I moved into a nursing home. And all of our family and friends came to ensure my well-being. So when I asked her once again, why is this so important to you, these milestones? She said, you see, when you reach our age, you forget your last conversation or the last meal that you've enjoyed. But as you sit here day after day, often alone, what you remember are these milestones. And finally, I said, once again, why is this so important to you? And she said, these are the milestones that make our lives worth living. So the next time you orchestrate that association meeting or corporate event, remember, for many, it is a milestone. Therefore, in my opinion, events are indeed a never-ending story. And I employed, applaud all of you for being an important part of this precious journey. Although our history as a profession may span only half a century, I'm convinced that the, I'm convinced as I near the next age of my life, that your work 
your dreams and your genius for change making will become even more valued than ever before. You know, this year we celebrated and commemorated the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing and also of Woodstock. And both were seminal events in global culture. These events began with the same tools I see in this room today. Imagination, intelligence, creativity, planning, technology, and an unquenchable thirst for a better world. So whilst we savor the traditions of old, let us in this profession become architects of a bold new world, one with events without end. Indeed, it is our gift to future generations to advance this never-ending story so that at events, those who follow us may look upon your efforts as truly and perhaps merely a golden era for celebration. And as this golden era unfolds even more, it will require brave and courageous men and women such as yourselves to advocate on behalf of the value of live events within your villages, towns, cities, states, and nations. I also believe that professionals such as yourselves are also helping every day to create what I describe as the movement from the age of uncertainty to the age of adventure. In the 22nd century, I believe we will have moved from the golden to the platinum age through the seamless integration of technology, such as being developed by CLE Productions and others to create events without end. This event, as you know, is being live streamed today and then will be available online as a recording in perpetuity. Well, a son of my adopted land of Scotland knew this very well. Let me tell you about him. He was the son of a farmer originally from Aberdeen, Scotland. He was born in Virginia and he went on to fight for religious freedom. Religion played a key part in his life. His father and namesake uncle were both devout and were both major influences in his young life. Nevertheless, he was very uncomfortable as he became a teenager and a young adult with the role of the Anglican Church as the established religion in Virginia. And so he fought for religious liberty throughout his entire career. He enjoyed life and celebrations. Like you, he was a host at the Hanover Tavern, and as part of his duties, he entertained the guest by even playing the fiddle in the evening. Among those who stayed with him there during this time was a young Thomas Jefferson, age 17, who was en route to his studies at the College of William and Mary. While at the Hanover Tavern, he became interested in the law, and he finally became a successful lawyer. He was especially interested in the universal rights of all citizens and fought to repeal an unfair tax. He was accused of treason. However, he prevailed. And according to reports of the time, he prevailed by mobilizing the emotions of the lower ranks of religious and political outsiders. His success as a lawyer allowed him to gain treasure to purchase a large estate. And although he wished to abolish slavery, he did have 67 slaves. He wrote, although I am the master of slaves of my own purchase, and I am drawn along by the general inconvenience of living here without them, I will not, I shall not, and I cannot ever justify it. He was later so respected for his courage and integrity that his fellow citizens elected him to public office in Virginia. He was also warned to be careful and not upset the British overseers. And one day, in St. John's Episcopal Church in Richmond, he proclaimed these often quoted words. Gentlemen may cry peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. 
He then dramatically plunged an ivory letter opener towards his chest. Fortunately, he missed his chest. However, he made the point that day in St. John's Episcopal Church. And sitting in the front row were future presidents, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And as a result of his speech, troops from Virginia were dispatched to help win the U.S. War of Independence, a speech to be remembered for eternity. As a young child, my father would recite these words to me over and over again. They were, of course, written and proclaimed by the great patriot, and may I add, also like some of you, a host and a musician. This was the immortal American patriot, Patrick Henry. You see, my father, as the son of first-generation Jewish immigrants to America, knew in his heart that liberty was a gift that we must at all costs seek to preserve our right to promote freedom of speech, to create new ideas, to stage new parades, to orchestrate new festivals, to assemble large enthusiastic crowds through Ragbri, and to celebrate our enduring human spirit. My father, when he turned 80, telephoned me one day in Washington, D.C., and he said, Joe, I've decided to run for mayor of Dallas, Texas. And of course, I was, as we say in Scotland, gobsmacked, shocked. 80 years old, he's going to run for mayor. But the backstory is that years earlier, Papa had run for city council, and he had lost by just a few hundred votes because the election took place all over the city, and the people in other parts of the city did not know him. So in losing, he learned how to win. He filed a lawsuit in the Supreme Court of the U.S. I encourage you to look it up on Google, Goldblatt versus the United States of America. And even though the Supreme Court did not rule in his case, it so embarrassed the city officials in Dallas that they changed the legislation to now elect council people by their individual districts. So the second time he ran, he won by a few thousand votes, and the third time he won by an overwhelming majority. Well, with this encouragement from the people, he decided he would run for mayor. And he said, would you like to come home and help me? Well, I said, Papa, let me talk to Nancy first. Of course, she had already packed my suitcase. She had been talking to my mother. And off I went to Dallas. When I arrived, I said, Papa, how much money do you have in your campaign war chest? He said, more money than any other council races, over $25,000. I said, how much does the other man have? He said, over a million dollars. What does the other man do, I asked. Oh, he's the current mayor of Dallas. I said to Papa, how will we possibly win this election with only a week to go, very little money, running against a powerful figure? He said, Joe, where we have little time and little resource, we will make every moment of every day a special event so that we excite, we engage, and we influence others to follow us. So the Thursday night before the Friday election, Papa said to me, go in the closet and get that big banner and put it in the truck. I did as he commanded. Down we went to Central Expressway, which is like one of your highways, at rush hour, bumper to bumper traffic. And my father had always been a major proponent of mass transportation. He wanted a monorail throughout the city of Dallas. And so Papa and I unfurled the banner, and it simply said one phrase, Max, my father's name, says you could be home by now. Well, people started honking their horns massively, jumping out of their cars. Women were kissing him. Helicopters with cameras were filming him from above for the 6 o'clock news. And the next day, when there is to be no coverage in either newspaper of either candidate, because it might unfairly influenced the election, there on the front page of the Dallas Morning News, top of the fold in color, full color, oh, I forgot to tell you, when he was standing on Central Expressway, he was wearing a leprechaun costume. <laughs> the people who organized the St. Patrick's Day Parade thought it would be clever having the first Jewish city councilman be St. Patrick, the grand marshal of their parade. Papa kept the costume, wore it on the expressway, and the next day, there he is. So that night, around 10 o'clock, the results are coming in, and we were ahead 
by thousands of votes. And finally, at 1 a.m., the votes were tallied and the official announcement was made, and we lost by 200 votes. Well, you can imagine everybody was disappointed, but not my father. He simply said, now if you will follow me across the street to City Hall, I will explain what we're going to do next. Off he went, and indeed he had preset 200 chairs, a stage, sound system, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, this election was not won. It was stolen, and I will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt I am right. Well, do you remember a few years later in Florida, there was a certain voting issue with chads in the Bush-Gore race? That was the same system used for the first time in the Dallas mayoral election, because I was interviewed by the New York Times asking me if I was aware that it could have influenced my father's election as well. Papa got tired of fighting. He went home to rest. And in fact, the day after his 60th wedding anniversary, he died suddenly of a heart attack. A newspaper reporter wrote a tribute about Papa in the newspaper, and he said that unlike Socrates, who was always described as a political gadfly, which is why Socrates took his life, he said, my father was more like a firefly. You have fireflies here in Iowa, don't you, in the summertime? A firefly, that bioluminescent insect with that iridescent light that you follow just to see where it might take you. Well, I didn't think very much when I read that because I was still quite sad of losing my father. But one night in Washington, D.C., after teaching a late night class, I drove home through the park. And as I was halfway through the park to my home, I looked over to the right, and there in a field, it's covered with fireflies. And I'm not embarrassed to tell you I had to pull over to the side of the road, wipe the tears out of my cheeks, and give thanks to that journalist for that image of my father as that bright light that so intrigued and engaged others, they might just follow him out of curiosity. And so whether you are a candidate for mayor or a candidate to be the greatest event professional this state has ever produced. Remember, you must be a firefly. So I suppose my father's invocation of Patrick Henry indirectly inspired the title of my new book of memoirs, The True Joy of Life. This title is taken from the words written by the great moral philosopher, George Bernard Shaw. Shaw wrote that, this is the true joy in life, being of a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being a force of nature rather than a selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion, he said, that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it what I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle for me. It is sort of a splendid torch that I have hold of for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. So it is my fondest hope that my modest book of memories may provide some signposting for future generations who will take hold of that torch that you and I, in the 21st century events industry, have held for so long. In fact, I believe that I now see dozens, perhaps a hundred, current and future fireflies in this room, and many thousands more out with this room, who shall lead us to those bold new places where events may thrive in the future, because your tribe similar to the indigenous people of Africa and Australia, will perhaps be migratory in nature. And therefore, you have the ability to spread your love for the magic and mystery of live events all over the world. So I wish you good luck as you embark upon your journey. And I look forward to following your bright lights to see where they might take you and in turn take all of us. And please allow me, in our Scottish tradition, 
to offer a toast to you. In Scots Gaelic, when we make a toast, we usually say, Slanjava, which means to your good health. However, as it may be some time before we see one another again, allow me to offer what we consider to be our special toast that's reserved for moments such as this, when old and new friends come together. Then we say, Slanjava, Ohulila Nehink or to your great health, when I see you and when I don't see you, all the days of your life. And my lords and ladies of Des Moines and Iowa, as a result of the learning, networking, and friendships you've made here this evening, may I also wish you that all the remaining days of your life be as they should be. Special events. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Matt, over to you. Would you like to answer some questions? Sure, you go ahead. Uh, we have uh, actually a, a few minutes, so if anybody would like to ask Joe a question, I have a microphone we kind of walk around, and Joe can answer those for you. I'm not going to pick on Creighton because he already led us in the, in the welcome this morning. So. Sometimes, Matt, people are shy about asking the first question. Mm. So who has the second question? <laughs> Would you tell everybody who you are, please? Sure. Chris Anderson, Director of Philanthropy at the Playhouse. Um, for an event that you did not put on, but you went to, what was the, the best or the most memorable experience from that event? Not the event itself, but an experience from that event. I am so pleased you asked that question because you're in the field of philanthropy. One of my dearest friends was the producer of the Athens, Greece Olympic Games opening ceremonies, David Zolker. He was then brought to Scotland to produce the opening ceremonies for the Commonwealth Games. One of his ideas, con concepts for the Commonwealth Games was that there was a welfare housing community that had been abandoned, the buildings had been abandoned for 20 years, and he was actually going to blow them up live on television a countdown. Now why would he do that? Because it creates viewership. People will stay watching the four hour ceremony right to the end to see kaboom. Well I was interviewed on BBC television about it. I said it was a great idea, it was logical, it absolutely followed the narrative of the revitalization, out of the ashes would grow this new city of Glasgow. And then I went to one of my political conferences and one of my oldest, dearest friends in Scotland said to me, could I speak to you privately in this room? So we walked in the room, and he started to shake a little bit, and his eyes teared up, and he said, Joe, I didn't appreciate what you said on the BBC the other night. And I said, why, Doug? He said, because that was my home. My single mother raised me and my three brothers there for 20 years. That was my home. And I learned then the power of science versus the power of the human heart. So when I reported this back to David, he said, Joe, we've decided not to do this because of the pushback, but instead we have another idea. And here's how it worked. He decided to team up with UNICEF, the International Children's Charity, and during a moment in the Commonwealth Games, he would invite everyone in the stadium, 60,000 people, and also everyone viewing, to text a donation to UNICEF. Now it's done quite commonly today, but check the history. This was the first time this was ever done in 2014. And to date, that appeal has raised over 34 million pounds. So the linkage between philanthropy and live events, I think is going to grow. And you're beginning to see it with events like the Warrior Games, Invictus, and so on. I think you're going to see it grow and become, like my tartan, uh, indispensable in terms of how one strand supports the other. So thanks for asking that. Next question. Who's got another one? Back there. Hi. 
Hi, Shanna Davison, Aspire Event Management. In all of your years of experience, what has been your biggest challenge with an event and how did you overcome it? Well, Shannon, for all of you engaged in this field, you know there is no event without challenge. And that's what makes it exciting and fun and um, I would say memorable, you know, at the, at the end of the day. Gosh, there have been so many. I think one of the most surprising was when we produced a festival in Nashville, Tennessee called Summer Light Celebration. And one of our ideas was to have an outdoor laser show with the lasers projected on the front of the state capitol. And music to accompany it and so on. And so every night at 10 o'clock to keep people there, just like Disney with the Main Street Electric Parade, we would offer this free sono lumine, sound and light laser show. But as we began rehearsals, the architect of the Capitol walked over to me and said, I'm responsible for this building. You will not project lasers on this building. And I said, well, why? We've gotten permission from the mayor, the governor. He said, because it's going to lead indelible marks on the front of the building. <laughs> he really thought that the laser beam was going to inscribe all of the images in the word like graffiti on the building. So very quickly, I had to have the laser operator, and that's why you only work with the top professionals, produce evidence that there would be no indelible, enduring marks. And that evening, after he left, the laser director said, Joe, I want to show you one new effect that I've put on the building. And he put, well, I can't say it in proper company, the words that he projected that evening. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, in the age of today with everybody having a mobile phone, what if that, you know, appeared somewhere? I'd be eternally blamed for it. But that's an example of how you have to continually inform and educate your clients about events. For most clients, it's the first time they've ever been involved with an event, certainly a major one. And so by taking them through baby steps to make certain they understand and they take ownership of the event, it can only lead to greater success. We have time for one more? Anybody? Over here? Did I see a hand? No? Okay. That's us done? Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Matt. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, as Joe prepares for uh, his book signing, which will be over here in the corner, uh, obviously they are available for purchase if you'd like to um, have one. Uh, I'd like to extend some thank yous. Uh, to, first of all, to the entire CLE team who shared their ideas, helped plan and promote, set up and strike our event today. Without your support, today's event certainly would not have been possible. To Aaron Wetzel, who understands that helping others achieve their goals is one of the most important aspects of doing business. To Elise and the River Center, their hard work and hospitality made this space a wonderful spot for our event today. To Joe and his family, we appreciate you coming out today and being here and sharing Joe with us. Last but not least, thank you to all of you spending uh, your Monday morning with us. We hope uh, Joe's talk inspired you, uh, and we uh, hope that uh, the production doc helps, obviously, inspire the rest of your week. Last but certainly not least, we have one more production talk left for the year in 2019 which will take place Thursday, November 14th at the CLE Warehouse. Uh, Aaron Wetzel will be talking, uh, and uh, knowing Aaron, it will be certainly fun and engaging. So thank you again, everyone, for coming, and have a great day.